Good afternoon or, or good morning, everyone, depending on uh, your time zone. Um, my name is Todd Anderson. I'm Chief Product Officer at Lender Fintech. Um, thank you again for joining us uh, for another great webinar. Um, first, I'd like to just thank um, John and the team at Conduit for their support. Um, without their support, we, we are, uh, can't do um, sessions like this. So we appreciate the support from John and the team. Uh, and before I turn it over to John and the panel, I just wanted to remind the audience, uh, we encourage you to ask questions. So please, in your Zoom window, use the Q&A function. Uh, I'll be back with about you know, 10 or 15 minutes left, uh, and I'll tee those questions up to our panelists. Um, and then if you have any issues, feel free to use the chat function. Uh, for some reason, if sound goes out or, or whatever might be the case, just chat. Um, I'll go ahead and, and troubleshoot with you. Um, and then just as a, a, a reminder to the audience, we're gonna be launching a poll. Um, so look out for that, participate in the poll um, so we can get you uh, involved as well. So polling uh, and audience Q and A. So get ready for a great session. John, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you and the panel. Thank you, Todd, so much. And thank all of you for attending our humble little event. Uh, this is called, the title of this is Out of the Box Consumer Lending Strategies for Managing Against Market Disruptions. And my name is John Michael, and I will be the host uh, for this webinar. If you're interested in a webinar uh, that tackles the technology helping to transform the consumer lending space, then this webinar is for you. My job here is quite simple. Uh, my job is to provide a platform to the amazing thought leaders throughout our lent throughout the consumer lending industry. And speaking of amazing thought leaders, we have three of those. We have uh, three esteemed panelists uh, with us today uh, in our midst. And I wanna let them go ahead and uh, introduce themselves by saying hello and uh, sharing a few words about themselves. And I'll go ahead and start with you, Craig. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and say a few words about yourself, please. Certainly, thanks, John. It's a pleasure to be here with you today and to join Mary Lee and Dave. I'm Craig Hewitt. I'm Chief Operating Officer here at Yamaha Financial Services. Um, we support Yamaha products here in the US, uh, marine, power sports, motorsports, golf cars, and power products through a network of about 2,000 dealers. I'm, I'm a recent uh, member, or joined recently here at Yamaha. Uh, my bulk of my career has been in auto finance, Capital One, HSBC, and then most recently with GM Financial. And I had some uh, opportunities intermittently to work in protection plans and then in online or direct to consumer lending with a kind of a bit of a push into digital retailing technology. Um, again, it's great to be here with you, John. Thank you, Craig. Appreciate it. Dave, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, please? All righty. Uh, hello, everybody. And, and similarly, thank you for having me. And I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, name's Dave Burton Cheney. Uh, I've been in the consumer finance space, uh, similarly to Craig. Actually, we met way back when in the early days of Capital One in the late 90s as Capital One entered auto finance. Uh, by and large, through my career, I've mostly been involved in early stage formation um, within consumer finance, mostly auto. Uh, auto is always what I've most enjoyed, uh, various derivations of that, uh, with a short stint in the student lending space. Uh, but looking forward to talking, and hopefully we'll have a few interesting things for people to hear. Thank you, Dave. And last but not least, Mary Lee Phillips, if you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Sure. Hey, guys. And just want to echo the thanks for having us today, John. Hey, Dave. Hey, Craig. <laughs> Happy to be a part of it. So I'm Mary Lee Phillips. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Drive Time and our related finance company, Bridgecrest. Through Drive Time, we sell quality used vehicles through 120 locations across the country. Uh, my background before I joined Drive Time just over two years ago was actually in the lending space. So I was at Wells Fargo for over 10 years really focused on providing funding for different types of consumer finance companies, both through the securitization markets and also through the bank capital lending markets. 
Thank you very much. So what did I tell you? These are esteemed panelists, and I'm so glad to have you all here today. And as Todd mentioned on the front end, if you are listening to this, please uh, uh, jot down notes either mentally and or physically, and we will have a Q&A toward the end of this session, and we would love to hear your questions as well. I have a few questions myself. We'll go through those first, but we'd love for you to participate. And we will have a survey question coming up here, probably about 10 minutes or so. And please do your best to go ahead and participate participate in that survey question. So out of the box here, I want to go ahead and ask a question to our panelists. And the first question is, panelists, it's kind of like we're on the dating game here or something, isn't it? Anyway, <laughs> no, uh, the first question, panelists, uh, is what is the biggest challenge that you have had to overcome this year? As we know, 2020 has been one for the books, uh, and it's not over yet. Uh, we still have more damage to be done, so to speak. But what is the biggest challenge that you have had to overcome this year? And Mary Lee, I will go ahead and start with you, and then we'll go around the horn with that one. Yeah, sure. So fortunately, yeah, like you mentioned, this year, this question is an easy one. I think we've all faced <laughs> a lot of challenges, you know, with, with most of them being driven here by COVID. So you know, one of the challenges that we've really had is getting on top of all the business trends that are happening within our company. So when you think about a time like COVID, there's so much uncertainty, there's a rapidly changing regulatory landscape. So we're trying to stay on top of changing rules in 50 states, which even in normal times, I think, as we all know, is a challenge. But given the, you know, amount that these things were changing, it's like every day, every week, new rules coming out of what you can and can't do, um, you know, new safety precautions that we wanted to put in place for customers and employees, and then trying to tie that all together and understand some of the actual trends happening within the business, you know, separating out macro trends from, from sort of self-inflicted trends based on our response to different things. It's just been really challenging to get a clear crystal ball on what we're seeing in the business. Thank you very much. Yeah, the uh, the regulatory and compliance issue and those safety issues have been, oh, I mean, every company has had to deal with that. And, uh, and it still continues today. And who knows what this is going to look like moving forward, right? Yeah. All right, Dave, why don't you give this a shot? What about you, sir? Uh, you know, I think there's going to be a common theme of, of <laughs> different ways of talking about how, how you deal with COVID-19 and in this world. Um, I mean, I would echo you know, all, all the things that Marilee was talking about, it, it's the, the lack of clear direction and abilities. So much of what you do in lending and, and as a risk person, so much is always forecasting the future and creating consistency and discipline about your business. Uh, and I don't think anybody had really prepared for this type of you know, continuity planning or disaster recovery planning. And we've all thought about, you know, I have a flood in my facility or I have a macroeconomic shock and you know, we've done all our recession models. Uh, but I think the real issue with this is just that it is so unique and unplanned for and so long in duration. I mean, I think back in March, you know, it was almost exciting for a lot of people. We're testing our work from home models. We're, you know, we're doing a lot of things that we've always had all these continuity plans in place. And we thought, okay, you know, come May, June, it'll be over. And now we're into, you know, almost to November and there's no end in sight. You know, and really, you know, depending on who you talk to, you know, it might be worse over the next six months than it's been over the prior six months. And so I think that just creates, you know, a lot of just turmoil within your organization, you know, within your constituents. Um, and it just it uh, I think it just it, it forces people to think differently than they have before. Uh, I'm very proud of how the industry has responded thus far, um, but I think we're not through it yet. You know, it's 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 not a challenge we've overcome. You know, I think that's the big thing. It's we're still in the challenge because I do think the hardest time is when you come out of any kind of disruption. Everybody's in panic mode during it. It's actually how you come out of it and then what your new normal is. You know, how, you know, regulators, how do you adjust once you send people and we don't have to have them work from home, but we choose to or don't choose to is a very different position than I have no choice but to. And how you deal with those things, we haven't gotten to yet. So that's what I really you know, will continue to talk about is we're not through the challenge. Yeah, you're right. Uh, and like you said, we have a new norm. We're going to have a new normal. And nobody knows exactly what that's going to look like yet. In fact, I have a couple of uh, questions coming up or regarding that. Uh, thanks for bringing that up, Dave. Mr. Craig Hewitt, yeah. what do you have to say about that? 
So I, I think I agree with um, Mary Lee and Dave. It's, it's hard to tell whether it's partly sunny or mostly cloudy. <laughs> and I think your, your view changes minute by minute during the day. So I think the current challenge is the forecasting into 2021. Um, earlier in the year for us, it was getting people set up remotely. Um, we were a traditional office bound organization for security reasons. We leveraged desktops. Um, so we weren't on laptops, it, we weren't mobile and we had never practiced it. And a lot of your underwriting and funding operations are collaborative processes. Your that knowledge is in the air and it's being transferred between each, each in, uh, between individuals. And um, that's how you move the business. And all of a sudden we had to stop it um, without really a good plan and move it and catch up to it. So I think that was the first challenge of 2020 was just, you know, taking a very centralized operation and decentralizing it quickly. Um, and then as we process through, we've gotten better at that. We can talk about how we've, you know, gained ground on that challenge. Um, it's, it's as Dave and Mary Lee have, have indicated, it's all right, well, what's it look like in the future and how do I plan for that? Okay, well, let's talk about that while you're there. How have we gained ground on that on that challenge, uh, Craig? Why don't you start? So, on um, in in specifically to um, working through the COVID environment. Correct. Yeah, I think I think you know clearly technology has become a a, a, a driver. Um, we've done in addition to just leveraging technology techno, technology platforms to communicate. Um, a good bit of training on how to coach and collaborate in an online environment. Um, I think you heighten the level of interaction between associates. Um, you learn how to use um, online chat functionality to communicate and coach. Um, but again, it's, um, it's, I think we were pushed into it. I think our, our biggest kind of question to answer is what do we do post COVID? Do we embrace some of our learnings and adapt our model? And we, there's some leanings towards that. I mean, certainly from a morale standpoint, um, we're located in Atlanta and in um, Orange County. Um, the good news there is there's zero traffic, right? So it's easy to commute. Uh, in fact, we're in high <laughs> you know, traffic congested areas. And so, you know, long commutes for employees. And so, um, you know, we found that, um, our productivity was um, remained strong. Um, it, you, you, you're challenged a little bit by having people work too much because they can't separate themselves from the office. So we saw a lot of people logging in and staying logged in, working longer hours. Um, I think the longer term question is around culture and how do you maintain the culture of your organization when you're decentralized and um, so much of it was built through the you know, face-to-face -face engagements and collaborations throughout the day. Very nice. Mary Lee or Dave, do you all want to pile on with that? How, we've, how have we gained ground, if you will, in, in regards to COVID? Yeah, I would echo a lot of what Craig said. I mean, I think, you know, the reality is, particularly for a business like ours, just like Craig mentioned, ours was also, you know, all in person and we had to send a lot of people home. We still have a lot of employees in our retail stores and reconditioning centers in person. But other than that, we're pretty much all voluntary work from home. And, you know, our managers are fantastic people leaders, but they've been taught how to lead people in an in-person environment. And so all of a sudden now you're adding, how do you facilitate Teams meetings or virtual meetings? How do you facilitate a virtual call with 10 people on it? It's just completely different than being in the room. And so we've done some training on that. We talk about that a lot. We also found that the video connection is really important, even all the way down to some of our call center agents, you know, being able to connect kind of face to face like we are here where we can see people and you can see the reactions from the standpoint of creating that long term culture. I think that's so important. So we've invested in some of the, the video conferencing capabilities really for all of our employees, even in the stores to try to help keep people connected in a way that you know, I think we all thought it was a little kind of gimmicky leading into COVID, right? It was sort of a funny thing, like, oh yeah, we're going to get on a video call. And now it's just part of our normal life. So I think that's helped a lot. Um, and I think we're just, we're kind of figuring it out. Yeah, you're right. It was kind of gimmicky to begin with, and nobody wanted to turn on their cameras. And uh, 
now it's becoming a part of everyday life. Dave, is there anything you wanted to add there? You know, just to uh, to kind of break it up a little bit rather than pile on, um, because I think um, the, the statements are exactly true and, and you know, businesses, they adapt, right? So if this is the new norm that you have to be in for a period of time, you know, it, it's what's so great about how business works. It will adapt. Uh, I'm going to take more of the contrarian view and say, I don't think that's necessarily a positive and a good thing. We've adapted to what we have to deal with. I, I think we're finding where we can make it work well. We're finding things that worked better than we anticipated it would. Uh, but I don't think you know, it should be considered a good thing if the new norm is to depersonalize people from each other and to create less you know, collaboration between people and to create artificial. I think there's a role for it. And it's great that companies are now going to be better at it going forward and can use it. Um, but I'm hoping what comes out is more of the hybrid model rather than, you know, some of the companies are already, you, you, you always end up with, um, you know, a lot of people love to, the radio is going to put, you know, or TV is going to put radio out of business. And you love people who love to guardrail to guardrail statements. Um, so I think some of the progressive companies who are saying, we're going to shut down our offices and be virtual forever, they're going to change as soon as their competitors are back in the office and are able to strategize and type, bring top people and create better morale. Um, so I'm hopeful that this leads to just a better hybrid model where we're able to use the technology when it works. Um, but I do, I do think there needs to be a transition back to, to more collaborative team building, um, close networking of people. I think it's just too important. Yeah, so, and I, I have a tendency to agree with you that it's going to be a hybrid model moving forward, but do you think that we'll ever get back to, I guess, what it once was to where, you know, completely to where everyone's going to the office, the the roads are packed, and, you know, we're going to conferences all the time, I mean, or do you think it's going to be some sort of hybrid there, Dan? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm a very opinionated person, of course we will. Um, you know, when the stock market was at 6,000 in 2009, the amount of people who said, we'll never see 10,000 again in our lifetime. When the stock market was at 18,000 in March, you know, we'll probably, and, you know, two months later, it's at record levels. The rebounds, you know, in the end, what works is what we will do. And there's a reason why the roads were packed. There's a reason why the offices, because it works. It makes things successful. It's why we had the vibrant economy that we had. So again, I think companies will know how to use technology better. I think you'll find certain roles and maybe certain even industry sectors that will be more in the, you know, in the online. But you're absolutely going to see, by and large, companies are going to return to what works. And, and I think it's just a matter of when will that be. And I don't know. We don't have an answer yet because we really just don't know when the new norm will be there. But I absolutely think um, it's, it's kind of like when people were saying, you know, ride sharing and, you know, self-driving cars are going to mean people no longer buy cars. I don't think that that's a realistic forecast. As soon as we get that immunization shot, we're just going <laughs> to see the roads all crowded again. <laughs> Back yeah, at work. I, I'm just, I'll, I'll, I don't think I'll it'll happen on. that quick. I'm just kidding. Yeah. John, I'll add on to that a little bit. I do think that um, Dave's right in the kind of pendulum swing that happens, although it's hard to unknow what you know. And so I think there are some learnings around cube farms and packing people in that I think will change the office dynamic or the real estate, corporate real estate dynamic a bit. Um, and I think, I think our employees... And in many occasions, I talked about this just a few mo moments ago, I think our employees have enjoyed, to some extent, not having to go through the commute every day. So I, I do think it becomes um, an opportunity from a competitive, in a competitive hiring market, if um, you have some level of hybrid, as Dave pointed out, hybrid strategy where there's a little bit of work from home. So I, I, I think that's the go forward. I do think you're going to have to incorporate a little of what we've seen in covid um, I'm not of the mindset that the office environment is going away completely and we're all going to live in a virtual universe. Yeah, the commercial real estate people will probably uh, enjoy uh, hearing <laughs> that. So as we move forward, what has been the most interesting trend uh, in 2020 for you uh, and your, in your opinion uh, for consumer finance? So what's been the most interesting trend in consumer finance in 2020? Uh, Craig, I'll go ahead and start with you. What do you think? Yep. So I think there's, I think there's two. I mean, one, we, we've talked about it um, here multiple times now. It's the work from home, right? I think that's a, a, a change um, that, you know, a couple of companies had embraced in, in their history, but I'd, I'd say most had not. So that's an interesting trend. 
Um, I think the other one is, you know, that our, our traditional risk models didn't work in this environment when you have, you know, significant drops in GDP and right 30% and unemployment goes up to double digits in the high teens. Um, you know, that's a precursor for some really bad news. And in many ways, we got the opposite through this, um, this environment. So I think that to me is a, an interesting trend that, you know, kind of is still straggling with, all right, well, what does it look like in, in 2021? Um, we may have missed, you know, passed the pandemic depression, but are we staring down the pandemic recession? So I think it's just how, how loan performance um, worked out in 2020. Thank you. Mary Lee, what about yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly would echo all of what Craig said. I think there's also some really interesting trends going on in how we provide customer service. And that's really across consumer finance, both on the origination side and also, you know, as we provide customer service on the servicing side. I think our customers continue to reach out, you know, more virtually through different channels, uh, whether that's on the website, whether that's, you know, through chat or text. I think there's clearly been a, a huge shift over the last few years. And I think that shift in consumer preference has really just been accelerated by COVID. And then in response to that, there's some really interesting uh, technology and automation, right? That continues to evolve when you think about, you know, AI, chatbots, really the believability of the automation as the consumer on the other side. It used to be pretty obvious, right? You knew if you were chatting with a bot, it was pretty clear. And I think the evolution there, you know, whether it's on a virtual channel or even some of the voice technology is really exciting. Like that very much. Dave, got anything in that arena? Yeah, I'll, I'll throw something a little bit different is uh, what, I, what I've been watching over the last couple of months that is the most new to me is, you know, seeing the emergence of SPACs. You know the the special purpose acquisition companies. Yes. Uh, you know, already being somebody who's done startups and has worked with private equity to launch companies in a couple of different spaces. You know that traditional model: you build the company, you potentially IPO, and or you get acquired by a strategic partner. You know, in lending, it's usually a large bank. Um, in subprime, at least in subprime auto, you know, the large banks being your acquisition partner has been off the table since uh, really since 2010 and the new kind of era that we're in. Uh, and going public, you just don't get the multiples and it just, there hasn't been that appetite for the space, but now you have this new, and to me, it's, it's interesting because it's not new. I thought it was a totally new creation that had not been out there before, but it's been around for a very long time, but you just haven't seen it in our space. And now it's popping up everywhere in our space, which is, you know, these, these entities acquiring companies with already public money. And kind of rolling up. And, and I think you're going to continue to see that. And, and that's a lot of the conversations I'm having with people is they're not looking to raise money to go launch a company with, they're looking to raise money to launch a SPAC to then go acquire companies. And I just think it's going to be interesting to watch what that really means, uh, especially within the M&A, especially as you cross into the fintech space. So how do you think that will eventually play out? <laughs> You know, in the end, you know, a company, you know, is either a good investment or a bad investment, regardless of the capital structure by which you purchase it. So it doesn't fundamentally change whether a company is a good or bad investment. So it will be interesting because you're seeing now, yeah, I think you're seeing deals getting done that wouldn't otherwise be done or at least be done at the multiples. Um, but I don't know. Again, it's not my area necessarily of expertise. It's just something that I'm finding very interesting. Um, so we'll see. I, I, I tend to find that you know, you can't change a market simply by, you know, it, the markets are still going to be the markets, you know, fundamentals are still fundamentals. Um, so we'll, we'll see what it really ends up doing. Very nice. Yeah. Now I can always count on you for something different, Dave, uh, the SPACs. I did not think that was going to come <laughs> into the conversation today. That's absolutely fantastic though. I love it. All right. So uh, Todd, and you can go ahead and uh, uh, throw up that uh, a survey question that we have now, because it's going to kind of pertain to this next question that I have. And that is, so I'm going to ask the panelists the question while this uh, poll is up there on the screen, but it, uh, in the role that you're playing today, um, how are you feeling about 2021? And, and what do you think is going to be uh, and, and maybe we've, we've already talked about some of this, but uh, what do you think will be some of the most important initiatives for you and your company uh, moving forward into 2021? Uh, and I'm sorry, we'll start with uh, Mary Lee. 
Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I think some of the technology that I mentioned earlier is is pretty exciting as you look at 2021. But, you know, in particular, it's really hard to plan. I think we're all sort of looking at what happened with COVID as, as the other panelists have mentioned. It's even, you know, expecting something like COVID to happen was difficult to plan for. Everything we did was very reactionary. And so as we think about 2021, trying to get some stability back in the business trends, certainly starting to plan around long-term flexible work. You know, I, I, we kind of adopted that term flexible work because I don't think it necessarily is all work from home or all work in the office. I think as we've mentioned, there's probably this hybrid solution there, um, but certainly a, a lot of planning around that. And then really we'll have to be a little bit reactive to some of the government response as well. There continues to be a lot of uncertainty on that front. The election clearly throws an additional wrench in that. And then what happens with a potential another round of stimulus remains to be seen. Okay, so, I, and, and I wondered whether to even bring this up, is that you brought it up, Mary Lee. I'm going to go ahead and talk about it a little bit. So in regards to the election, right, I don't want anybody to go left or right here. I don't want to get into one of those kind of discussions. We could have people dropping out left and right. Uh, but when you think about the election, uh, is there any, so in, in sitting in the chairs that you guys sit, right, where you have to make important decisions. I mean, you know, there's decisions that you make can actually affect people's lives within your company, at least, you know, and, and, and their, their livelihood and many other things. Is there any way to plan around an election or do you just kind of sit back and watch it happen? How do you go about something like that? Uh, we'll start with you, Craig. Yeah, so candidly, it's been a non, um, it's not been a discussion item for us um, because I think, we, you know, it's hard to read what direction it's going in. Um, I do think that um, there's a chance that the regulatory environment changes. So, um, you know, we'll, 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 we'll work through that. Um, I, I think, you know, we've come a long way in consumer lending in regards to transparency, disclosures, right, compliance, um, a long way. And um, directionally, I think we've always been going down the right path on that. It's sometimes, you know, um, the execution piece that can feel a little clunky, but directionally, I think, you know, since the foundation of the CFPB, it's had the right path towards transparency, disclosures, et cetera. Um, but no, I, you know, John, we haven't as an organization really got into that. Candidly, we're more uh, at a micro level around what's our portfolio going to do, right? How, how, you know, so certainly stimulus talks are, I guess, a piece of that um, and the likelihood of, of stimulus. Um, and, you know, I think, um, I think we'll get some form of stimulus. I don't think it'll be what we saw earlier this year. And I don't think that level is necessary, but I do think we'll get some, I mean, there's a lot of people that, that need to bridge the gap. And so um, I think w whether it's a Republican administration or a Democrat administration, there'll be some form of stimulus. So does it change your outlook like uh, at the beginning of November, what actions you all are taking? And this is for all of you. Does it change your strategy, if you will, at the beginning of November versus the end of November? Or do you think, for the most part at least, it's just business as usual? Uh, Dave, Mary Lee, you want to add on to that? Yeah, you know, I'll jump in. I mean, it, it affects me personally. It, you, know, perfect, you know, to me, you always have to separate running a business versus running your own life. When you're running a business, first of all, nothing changes that quickly within a change of administrations. I mean, so it's not like, you know, the parties switch, you know, first of all, November, you have November, but then you have, you know, well, you're not even in office for months. And then, you know, and then you have to start setting policies and putting people in roles. And then, you know, so, you know, take the example of if you're going to have a more restrictive, you know, compliance with the CFPB. It doesn't change anything I'm doing in November. It probably doesn't change anything I'm doing in March. It probably, so you're not, it, it's, I think it's foolish to plan. You know, that's speculation. And I'm sure, I'm just not sure what you would actually do. Your job's to react to what's there in business. And so what you do is you wait till you actually know what is in front of you and you react to what's in front of you. So I honestly think who wins in whether it's the presidential election, the Senate, the house, you're just gonna adapt as a business. That's your job as a business leader. I'm more concerned about recessions and I'm more concerned about, you know, a, a large competitor doing irrational things and things of that sort than necessarily politically. 
personally, I have very strong views, but that's me personally for how it affects my personal life. Business, your job's to run the business within the environment you're in. That makes sense. Mary Lee? Yeah. Yeah. I would largely agree with that. I think most of it's reactive. I completely agree with Craig from the standpoint of a lot of the consumer protections. I think the industry has developed in a way where um, everybody's a, you know, as good of an actor as they can be. And, and that's, you know, where it ought to be. So I don't think there's necessarily a huge reaction there. Um, I would say, you know, we plan to generally be reactive. I think as Dave mentioned, um, the government is built to be slow and we, we all like to, you know, take the downside of that when it feels like it's taking forever, but that's also a good thing from a, from the standpoint of long-term business planning. I would say, you know, from a short-term planning standpoint, we try not to be in the capital markets right around that time. We try to plan our funding schedule throughout the, the year to not, um, you know, have any sort of excess volatility. And there just tends to be volatility one way or the other in the capital markets when you've got, that type of backdrop. Um, but, you know, I, I think over the longer term, most of the industry is adapted in a way that um, should allow it to be incredibly successful, regardless of whichever way this goes. Okay, so I brought up a little politics. I promise not to bring up religion. Okay, I do, we're going to leave it at that. <laughs> Deal. But we'll I, never did, on that. <laughs> I never did give uh, Dave or Craig a chance to answer that. Uh, uh, what are you feeling about going into, the, into 2021? What is your thought on that? Yeah, I'll take a, a swing um, first, Dave. Um, there's, there's two thoughts. Um, on the retail side of our business, I think we, we feel pretty good. Um, you know, our inventories were, 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 were drawn down during the, um, during 2020, cleared out a lot of aged inventory. So in many ways, that's healthy for us as a business. Um, a lot of our, um, a lot of our dealer sales are already pre-booked, you know, they're, 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 um, deposit made orders, right? So I'm, buying that piece for when it arrives, I, I want to take, you know, ownership. So we've got a lot of pre-orders um, already kind of in the pipe. So I think the sales side of our business will continue to be strong. I think it'll taper off towards the latter half of the year. Um, I, 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 you know, and there's, there's some challenges that, that, that presents because we have a wholesale business. So it kind of compresses our wholesale amounts. So it's good from the sales side. It's, it's a, it's a, downdraft on our wholesale business, or at least our balances. Um, some of our more aged products that we get a little more yield on. Um, so there's some impact to us from, from that standpoint. I, I think the, um, I, I, w our belief is that lo losses are going up. We think that losses are going to trend up. Um, I think the consumer and I think corporations came into COVID um, healthy, solvent. And, um, and then you threw a ton of stimulus in it and, you know, a couple trillion of juice um, really shot things up and uh, household debt was, you know, going down. Um, and I think that trend will invert and household debt will go up in 2021. And so I think we're going to see a lot more stress in the consumer, which is going to lead to, you know, losses in our portfolio. Thank you, Craig. What about you, David? And after uh, Dave shares, by the way, we're going to go ahead and share the uh, poll results with everybody. But go ahead, Dave. I, I think 2021 is going to be a very transitional year and a much um, a much harder. Year. I don't want to say harder year because I think 2020 was hard because of the amount of change. Uh, but financially for companies, yeah, I, I think everybody came out much stronger than they were anticipating it would be in March uh, for all the reasons that have been mentioned. I, I think 2021 is going to be uh, more challenging financially. The the war chests have been built, and I agree. I think losses, I think consumer risk will be higher in 2021. Um, I think there will be companies who are well positioned. That's why I would call it transition. I think there's companies that are prepared for it, have the capital structure for it, have the, the excess spreads within the way their products are priced. Um, but I'm also hearing a lot of companies that are, you know, they're, they're feeling like they've weathered the storm, the storm's behind them, and now is the time to go back into high growth mode. And I, as I mentioned earlier, I don't think people have weathered the storm yet. You know, I, I think the storm has been for, for the stimulus reasons and for the slowdowns and things that have happened, I think we actually haven't really seen the storm yet. So I think there might be some companies that are in a high growth mode now, trying to restore and return what has been lost uh, that may, may see some challenges. I also have concerns for people working from home, 
after nine months or 12 months or 15 months of working from home will create some HR and management challenges for companies as well. Again, for some people, it'll work out, but I'm, you're already beginning to hear of the hangover and some of the, 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 the terms that are beginning to come out about, you know, Zoom, you know, too much dependence on and, and tiring of constantly looking into your computer monitor. Uh, companies are not hiring around innovation you know, there, it's a lot of status quo, which has helped build the war chests and allow their costs to actually um, be reduced during a lot of this. But you, you still have to innovate. You still have to bring in new people. You still have to create new teams and launch new products within your organization. All of that's very challenging in the current environment we're in. So if we're still in this mode come summer of 2021, that's, I think, going to start you know, you'll start seeing the companies that were able to adapt, but you'll also start to see the companies that couldn't. You know, you don't see that in the first couple months, but all, all these things, I think it's just going to be, I think there's going to be some real success stories, but I think there's going to be some companies that really struggle, you know, coming into two and getting, getting through 2021. Well put. Thank you, Dave. Uh, very good insights. Okay, uh, Todd, why don't you go ahead and put up the uh, poll results? So the question <laughs> was, which of the following consumer lending financing tools and technologies will be most important in achieving your 2021 initiatives? And it looks like um, the second choice, third-party data and risk scores actually won out. <laughs> hmm. Uh, yeah, that's kind of an interesting one to me. What do you what do you guys think about that, Dave or Mary Lee or Craig? Do you have any thoughts on that? I would have liked to see a larger sample on all of these. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, I think depending on what you where you are within the organization, because when I saw this poll, I didn't know how to answer it. Um, because if I was speaking from a people management within my organization, I'd hit one button. If I was speaking from a risk management, I'd hit a different. So I, I think they're all important things, but they matter very differently to different people within the organization. And it's going to probably be very similar to our listeners, depending on what their role is and where they are, they're going to answer the question differently. Well put. Thank you. All right. So Oh, Let's sorry, move guys. on to another question here. Uh, and this one's going to be, what remains the greatest impediment to the true online purchase model for vehicles, right? Um, and um, Mary Lee, being a drive time, uh, you know, I'm sure you have some thoughts on this. And does this differ for your new versus used models? And so once again, let me go ahead and repeat that. What remains the greatest impediment to true to the true online purchase for vehicles. Mary, yeah. Lee, I'll let you go ahead and start on that. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, first of all, this is clearly happening today. So <laughs> there is an online way to buy a car, um, but there, there still are a lot of impediments for a lot of dealer groups out there. And I think some of that comes down to the integration of different technologies. You know, I'll let um, some of the others maybe speak to the new side. But as far as it comes down to use, as you think about the dealer's ownership of the various lending terms, the ability to plug that all together instantaneously, I think remains challenged. Now that continues to evolve quickly. So I'm confident that that'll continue to improve. Um, but as you think about, you know, within used in particular, the diversity of funding sources, each lender having their own way of integrating, each dealer having their own technology, really trying to bring that, bring that all together, I think is a challenge. Um, but it's one that we've seen, you know, frankly, with COVID, people have figured out how to overcome. And I think it's a little bit of duct tape and a little bit of stitches. So we'll see, you know, how the long term solutions come together. But there's no doubt in my mind that, you know, this, this reality of purchasing online as one of the ways, not the only way, but one of the ways to acquire a vehicle, um, you know, certainly accelerated through COVID. Thank you very much. Craig, what about yourself? Yeah, so I, I would agree with um, with Mary Lee that I think there is a company out there that from a journey perspective has got it pretty well, you know, baked out. Um, and, it, and, it's, and it's the Carvana model. Um, it's, it's seamless. Um, it, it, it takes a lot of online purchase experience into that, that journey. Um, I think you got to incorporate at the end of it, those return policies that people are used to in an online experience. So I think that's ultimately you know, somewhat of a challenge for the individual dealer operator. Um, on the flip side, I think that, you know, dealers have a, have a real opportunity because 
in many ways, I think used car buying can be localized. There's a lot of inventory out there for you to shop from. And so um, I think they have an opportunity to um, seize on that. But I think that, you know, just overall outside of a one price type of model, which is what we see predominantly on in online sales, um, I think you're going to struggle uh, with negotiation, the back and forth, although I do think models are starting to address that. I think, um, you know, scaling actual cash value on trade-ins um, and not using some type of, you know, um, estimator that really does, you know, kind of helps you get in the ballpark, but doesn't solve your I want to know, which is what we see in a lot of the success of online shopping in, in the car business. Um, so I think those are the probably the, the primary two is, you know, how do you really go back and forth? I mean, you know, in that online experience, I want to feel like I can, I can shop at my pace from my place, I can save my work and come back to it. And so you have to have those garage type of capabilities. Dave and I, you know, played around with this when we were at car finance. So we, we, we have a little, we have all the wounds from trying to, to <laughs> figure this stuff out. And um, so I think, I think it's a, you know, I love the idea of being able to um, just fulfill my, my, what I want at a place. But I do think that there are a couple of hurdles for, um, you know, to, to really see it scale. Um, I think there's a couple of hurdles that are going to have to be um, negotiated. Thank you, Craig. And by the way, and I'm going to let you answer in just a second, Dave, but keep in mind, we're going to have a and a here and it's going to be coming up soon. So if you're watching this and you have some sort of questions that you would like to pose either to the group as a whole or to an individual, uh, one of the panelists here, uh, go ahead and go to the Q&A feature and uh, type in your question. We'll be glad to uh, pose it for the panelists here. So uh, Dave, what, what about you? What do you think? You know, th th this is actually a question that we could probably have an entire, you know, hour long panel on and, yeah. you know, and it may even make sense to do that. You know, to me, you know, to, to, to add to some of it, you know, some of it's just how you do, how do you define buying a car online? You know, depending on who you are and how you define it, you already can fully effectively buy a car online today or you cannot do it anywhere in a full way. I mean, so it, some of it is just the, the relative perspective of the individual. I think that the biggest challenges are it is a, an extremely complex transaction at times. So, you know, it, what's hard is building a model for the person who is a prime customer with no trade, who knows what they want. That's one. But then you get all the way to the subprime customer with a trade that has unknown value and they have unknown credit. And there's there's just so many pieces that you know become challenges that. You know, I, and, and I'm not sure you need to do everything online. A consumer who can freely shop for inventory, pick the vehicle that they like, narrow it down to three or four, send a text to the dealerships, get a text message back, negotiate the price, have the financing negotiated and have the vehicle. How is that not buying online? But from a technology perspective, you'll have people jump in and say, well, these three steps technically were not online. But from the consumer, they just bought the car online. So, so some of it is, you know, I always like to look, and Craig and I have had tons of conversations on these sides in the car finance days, is defining, you know, what is the consumer not getting that they want? rather than what is a, a technologist who has a neat patent frustrated is not being used. Because those are, I think, some of also the challenges. Uh, the other big challenge is you go to any dealership site, there's 50 different vendors and 50 different technologies you know, kind of presented that allow all of the things to be digital and online. And getting those all to talk and communicate and interact, I think, also is a big challenge, but it's very expensive and it also limits to try to have those all integrated if you're the dealer, because they're constantly changing, evolving, and there's new ones coming in. So I, I, I just think it's going to be something that is emerging, developing for quite a while. Uh, but I also think there's always, similar to my comment on the radio and TV, there's, there's always going to be a need still for the dealership and the community presence and the on-site gets all the way through servicing and customer service and access. Um, but I, again, it, these, these are more, in my mind, going to be hybrid models of consumers who want to choose to do more from home versus the consumers who don't. It, the good news is it is a massive market. And so there's, a, there's plenty of room for a lot of different you know, types of technologies within it. 
Thank you, Dave. And Todd, I had told you that I was going to, I wanted you to take the uh, Q&A questions, but I think I'm going to go ahead and run with them. I see how it's uh, occurring now, so I'm good to go. So we have a question from the audience. Um, uh, Felix is the first one to come in with a question here. He says, within your organizations, what are the biggest concerns for consumer lending and how are you preparing? So we may have talked about this uh, at length, but is there anything else that I, any of you would want to add? Da Dave, Dave uh, Mary Lee, or Craig? I would echo some of the comments that Craig had around the portfolio performance over the next year or two. I think, and Dave, you may mention it as well. I think um, there certainly was a big shot in the arm with all the stimulus. I think the the fallout after that clears, you know, whenever that has sort of digested through the system still remains really unclear. And so I think a lot of us are still uh, trying to wrap our arms around how the portfolio over the longer term will come together. We have another question here from Mr. or Ms. Anonymous. Uh, it <laughs> says, uh, with another recession possible, and lenders tightening their credit boxes, how are you thinking about volumes in 2021? Good question. What do you think about volumes going into 2021? Uh, we'll start with you, Craig. So I, I think I, I touched upon it briefly um, a few minutes ago. I think, I think volume in, your, in, our, in, in my world, which is captive finance, I think our new product is going to move um, briskly. In, in 2021. We're a little different from auto. We are that perfect fit for people that aren't going to Disney World or traveling to Europe, right, but still want to have some type of engagement and in a socially distanced manner. So whether you want to get on a sport boat or an ATV, right, we, we provide that type of accommodation. So I think our, I think our sales are going to be brisk. Um, I, you know, I think, um, I think car sales will stay um, pretty strong as well. Um, so I, I think those, I think those are going to remain. I think, um, as I said, I think there is risk within, uh, the credit perspective and I'll, I'll take a step back to the previous question. I do think, you know, the more we move into a digital format or digital frontier, push the digital frontier, the know your customer technologies become really important to us. So, um, that was one of the questions where I would have thought we'd see a little more, um, response around the importance of in 2021 and beyond is the know your customer tech technologies. Dave or Mary Lee, you have anything to add to the volume discussion? If not, we have well, plenty of the, other questions. The only thing I would say is if we do enter into a, a traditional recession and not, not a shutdown oriented recession, um, you know, if you enter a recession, volumes will be down, period. I mean, that's, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's the definition of a cycle. I think, uh, and Marilee mentioned that the, the industry has policed itself very well from the wild west days of the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, we've had cycles since. 2015-16 um, was really a cycle. A lot of the naysayers started talking about the implosion and the destruction, you know, this is going to be the end of the auto finance and subprime sector. And it very rapidly policed itself. The lenders you know, reduced volumes, they increased margins, they uh, made sure they had adequate capital. And you very quickly saw 2017 right back to some of the best loss performance. You know. But what you've seen since is, is much, uh, at least for most of the lenders that I'm associated with, much um, larger margins associated with what they book. You don't see you know, the, the actors who are really doing volume plays who are willing to take very thin margins, risk the future in order to gain size, which you saw some of that really with some of the bigger banks in the early 2000s. You just don't see that in the industry today. So I, I think it's a very resilient and a very robust industry and it will do fine um, in minor recessions. Makes sense. Mary Lee, did you wanna add anything on that one or you want me to go on to another question? Yeah, I just really quickly would say, I think volume within used auto will remain really strong because there's a lot of fundamental dynamics, particularly within some sort of economic disruption that support that. I think what'll be really interesting, particularly for us serving that more credit challenged customer, we tend to serve more of a, a middle income, lower middle income customer. When you look at unemployment by income bracket, it is still you know rapidly off where it was for that lower income, lower middle income customer. And I think that's a dynamic that will continue for those of us that serve that, that customer segment. Makes sense. Thank you very much. All right. The next question 
is also from an anonymous source. It says the, w, the, uh, the Wall Street Journal reported recently that credit scores are at record levels despite the economic challenges. How do you underwrite when credit data is unreliable? So once again, how do you regulate or how do you underwrite when credit data is unreliable? So uh, Dave, we'll start with you on that one. You got any thoughts on that? Yeah, you underwrite unreliably. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's, you know I, I actually, I think I posted a few things in response to some of the uh, rising FICO scores that have happened. Um, it's the Wall Street Journal. I don't have the article in front of me. If it's referencing that they're up during COVID, they're missing the fact that they're up almost perfectly um, linearly since 2010 in terms of FICO scores. So it's now a full decade that they've been rising year over year. So this is not a new change to people's risk models and risk scores. This is what's been happening to FICO now for over a decade. Um, you know, in, in the end, like all things, you know, <laughs> You, you, you always, you know, you look at your models, you retro score, you do forward performance. FICO for most auto lenders is not a really big factor. It's a very big factor in the prime space and in the mortgage space. It's a much less factor in the auto finance space. Most of the scorecards, you know, they're in it, but it doesn't drive a lot. And a lot more is based on affordability, stability, a lot of other metrics in addition to the LTV and value of the collateral being purchased for the borrowers. Um, so to me, it, it's, it's something that we as risk officers look at, um, but it's nothing that is new. Uh, I do think it'll continue. And I'm, I'm more concerned, not necessarily with rising scores, uh, but that increasingly consumers are learning and being taught how to have their scores um, eliminated or removed, um, because that has become the easiest way from a compliance management perspective for most lenders uh, within states. Um, a lot, a lot of the both state and federal level, you know, when consumers complain, the easiest thing to do is just remove it and they're learning that. And so you see more and more where people's credit euros don't reflect what they actually are doing. And I think that's actually a, not a service to individuals. I think that will long-term do harm to individuals, um, but that's more of a regulatory uh, policy issue. Okay, Mary Lee and then Craig, and then we'll do, I don't know if we're going to have time for one last question. How about we go Mary Lee and Dave, and then actually we're going to wrap it up. I'm sorry, everybody who's uh, submitting these questions, but go ahead, Mary Lee. Yeah, I would completely echo what Dave said. I think the credit cleaning as a short-term thing, I get it. I think long-term for the industry, that's a bad trend. Um, I, certainly FICO score in and of itself, I think Dave mentioned um, a lot of us don't rely on that as you kind of get deeper into the risk profile, you're really looking at the attributes there. But I do think there is something to be said for the lack of reporting during this time period that a lot of, a lot of lenders um, are facing. There's clearly a lot of extension activity and a lot of loan forgiveness and a lot of, ex, um, you know, other modifications that are being made that are sort of atypical. So none of our models know about them. Uh, I would say in response to that, I think a lot of us have built models now that rely on a lot of alternative data. So that's probably a benefit to the extent some of that stays um, a little bit more reliable. And then I think you're also in a world where you, you know, you have to have a fundamental belief that even if it's not maybe quite as accurate as it was when the data coming in was better, kind of the garbage in garbage out concept, that you're still going to rank order really well. And at the end of the day, rank ordering risk is the best you can do. Thank you, Mary Lee. Craig, you got anything to add before we wrap this baby up? I, I would just, to, you know, in reference to that article, I think Mary Lee touched upon it. I mean, a lot of um, risk management is done off bureau these days, right? Alternative data. Um, in that article, I think you have a snapshot in time. And that snapshot is during a period when people were locked down and a ton of stimulus was being poured into the environment, right? So consumer was healthy going in, locked down. I can't go to the movies. I can't go out to eat. I'm not at the bar. Um, I got paycheck coming in. I'm going to make my payments, right? I'm going to pay down my savings rates going up dramatically. So I think all of those things influence, you know, the portfolio performances. Thank you, Craig. So, so I could tell you this. You guys, the panelists, y'all, created much thoughts or many thoughts within our audience because we have a ton of questions here that we cannot get to today. So maybe we'll have to get back together and do this again at some other time. 
I, uh, I have so much appreciated you guys, Mary Lee Phillips, Dave Bertoncini, and Craig Hewitt, Craig Hewitt for joining us today. It was absolutely fantastic. I know we gave some people some good content and hopefully some uh, uh, thought, food for thought that they can actually take and apply to their business life today. Todd, is there anything you would like to add before we wrap this up? Just uh, thank you to, to you and your team for your support. Um, thank you to the panel for a great conversation. And anyone that tuned in, whether it be for a short period of time or the whole session, we will be um, circulating the recording of this to anyone that signed up. Um, so we will send this around. So if you missed part of it, you have to jump, you'll get it. Um, and just wanted to say thanks again. And uh, thanks again to the audience for coming back. Uh, we've been hosting these for uh, you know, pretty frequently since COVID happened. And, uh, you know, we appreciate their continued support of uh, you know, webinars like this. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you, John. This was a lot of rest fun. Of your afternoon. And I will say this, if there's That's anybody fine. on the line that has a question for me or any of the other panelists, feel free to reach out to me at john, J-O-H-N dot Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L at conduent.com. That's C-O-N. D U E N T, and we'll be happy to get you some uh, whatever information that you're looking for. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.